Hi, I'm Eric Ostro. Live with the Lortel is about to start. For season two, while theaters are dark, we are discussing with our guests their thoughts on the reckoning the theater community is facing for systemic racism and their vision for the future of the American theater. To broaden our perspective, I am sharing my platform with co-hosts from the BIPOC community. We offer these conversations to help us learn and to start the healing process. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Live at the Lortel. Uh, happy New Year, happy 2021. We are very happy to be on this new platform. We are actually now on YouTube, uh, which is very exciting. So we can be live and everybody can share in this experience. Um, I'm gonna get right to the show because we have a lot to talk about. Let me introduce my incredible co-host, Joy DeMichelle. Joy, get on here. Hello, Eric. You know, I don't like to be by myself. <laughs> so good to see your beautiful face. It's good to see your gorgeous face. I'm so <laughs> excited uh, for our guest today, and I'm so excited that we have these two to kick off um, Live at the Lortel 2021 yeah. live again, putting the live back into Live at the Lortel. So let me introduce these two. Um, let's, in let's bring on Whitney White and Peter Mark Kendall. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much. Hi. Hello. Say, so say hi to, to all of our YouTubers. <laughs> hey, YouTubers. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thousands of guests that, that we have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to get right to, you know, I, I kind of like to ask how the both of you are doing, um, you know, since we had this shutdown, since we all work in theater, you know, since March, how have you been doing um, mentally, physically? I mean, I, I know you, Whitney, you said you've been doing a lot of cooking, but I, I'm interested, you know, what's going on in your heart and in your head when the shutdown happened. Um, well, you know, it's funny. I spend the bulk of my time directing and when you're directing a show, you're kind of asking all these people to jump aboard a ship and like sail off with you in a direction. So you have all this kind of access to hiring power, gathering people, building community. And I feel like myself in particular, I really love building community around my shows. I tend to really love large ensemble shows, eight person shows and bigger and like making us all feel together. And I, I, I was in rehearsal. I had a rehearsal. I was directing a play at Steppenwolf in Chicago, a theater I love very much. Um, and just, I've never, I've never had to stop before. Um, I guess that's a privilege. You know, I've never had a show shut down. I've never mm -hmm. had to say, Hey, the checks have run out. I've, I haven't had that happen to me. And, um, you know, my cast, I had plucked a kid out of school for a semester who was 20 years old. It was his first equity show. And then I had another woman who was like responsible for family and her, her partner's children and like telling people, I'm so sorry, we can't come to work anymore. And but you get two weeks pay and three weeks health insurance, which the theater was very generous about. And I don't want to misquote it, but it was painful. It was like, I think for the first time, I really understood what directing is and or leading or curating and it's like you're responsible for people um for that time or at least i see it that way and so i felt immediately it was like march 13th which is actually something referenced in our piece um but it's like i didn't have a lot of concern for myself at first i just was like oh my god like actors crew people it's just so many people affected throughout our business and you know, when you're directing a show, you really get to see everybody come together and make the work. And it was painful. Um, it truly was. Um, and Anna Shapiro, the artistic director, was there for me in a wonderful way. And the cast was there. We were there for each other. But I definitely won't forget it. And I never want to let an ensemble down, you know. Uh, and that was like, even though it's not our individual fault that it's a pandemic you you felt i felt in that moment i was like god you know i wish there was more i could do um and then since then i think i've been trying to spend as much time either on the phone on zoom with family as much as possible i think <laughs> um we all know it's not a new uh sentiment that the arts, working in the arts is challenging. We work six day weeks. We work 12 hour days sometimes. We take these weird 20 minute breaks. 
We do eight shows a week. It's it's a pretty um uh full full on full mind body soul commitment. And I think that in the shutdown, while I was really mourning for our community specifically, uh, I also have had this incredible blessing of being able to connect with people um, that I haven't been able to in the way I want to in a long time. So it's a weird. It's a weird thing. It's like a blessing and also a lot of mourning. Uh, Peter, what about you? Um, yeah, I think very similar to Whitney. Uh, I was kind of right in the middle of things, I think, as we all were. Um, and then one day I was, I was, I was shooting a, 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 a television series in Baltimore where I'm from. And um, uh, the next day, uh, I shot the first day. And the next day they told us that they were closing down for the uh, for the virus and so I drove home and uh, kind of was left with this heartbreak of, of losing that job and kind of expecting like I think perhaps a few um, friends of mine were like oh yeah it's it's going to be it's not going to be as long as, as it has been it's going to be a, a temporary thing and we can all get back to the kind of um, our routines and our in our in our in our work and our families and friends um but then kind of the, the grief of not having uh, the jobs that I had, but also just not having the, the communities that I, that are so important to me, like the um, art making and otherwise. Um, and I think that all of us have tried to do our best to kind of fill that void in some way of like, how can we still be um, art makers and theater makers and how, how can we still engage with each other and see the world um, in our kind of special way that we do. And um, yeah, so it's it's been kind of like uh, trying to pivot and um, find other ways to connect with people that at first maybe felt like anxiety provoking, but now it's like kind of there's an ease to it or a familiarity with it. Um, and hopefully that doesn't stick around because um, mm -hmm. I think we're all desperate just for human touch and mm -hmm. congregation and community and sharing breath and like how um, how vital and essential that is. And yes. It's, uh, Whitney, uh, do, do you mind if I ask a question? Did you say that you got the message that your show was shutting down on it March was, 13th? It was, um, it was like Broadway shut down. Broadway, Broadway had happened, and then I have to pull up that date, but it was like really fast. And Anna Shapiro was herself about to open a show on Broadway, and then she came back to uh, Chicago, and she's like, uh, "Let's have a meeting before your rehearsal." And I went, and she's like, "We've got to stop." And I was like, "I figured it was coming." And then we just walked over to rehearsal together and like told the cast. It was like. It was like that. Um, so it was around the 13th. It wasn't necessarily yeah. on that day. No, but yeah. it was early on. It was like, I actually can pull up my, whatever. I don't have to look now, but it was, it was fast. Cause I had started rehearsals. It wasn't, maybe it was the 22nd. I had had two weeks of rehearsals and I got to Chicago on March 2nd. So it was like two weeks of rehearsals from March 2nd um, that it happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very significant day. Um, the 13th. Um, that's the same day that Brianna Taylor was killed. Yeah. And so I was wondering if, did you feel that that had an, an, an added um, cloud over telling people what was happening with the show? Uh, it's not just there's a pandemic, but there's also a tremendous amount of civil unrest that's happening right now at this moment as well. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you for that question and just making space for her and her life and may she rest in power. Um, it's funny how the news cycle has worked during this time because at that time she had been killed, but we didn't really get all the news. Remember that? It was a very, and also the optics of Black death is very challenging. Um, gender affects that. And it was funny. It was like the heartbreak of our business stopping happened first for me. And then really George Floyd happened for me. And then really I got into all of it. And it's been, I mean, there's no light way to put it. And I don't want to make it about me because it's about us. Um, but it, it's been a heartbreaking time. And it's colored every moment. Um, it's, I remember, you know, my first 
kind of play I did in New York was a ritual honoring black lives who have been lost to racialized violence by the very brilliant Alicia Harris. And it's called What to Send Up When It Goes Down. Alicia had written this piece, I think in 2016, while she herself was in graduate school. I don't want to misquote the date. And then we started working on it in 2018 together. And we have all these plans for it to tour and do all this stuff. And I remember when the shutdown happened, thinking, oh, I wonder if this piece won't be, we won't need this piece. Maybe we're in, it's going to experience something larger as a country. Mm -hmm. And just the repeated heartbreak and realization that um, this is never, this is not stopping. Um, I think it was, it, it for me colored a lot of this period. Um, and that's just real. There's no other way to say it. And I think for some people, because of the media cycle, it's like, you know, I won't go on about it too much, but it's like, it's easier to just people ride the media cycle. So when those names aren't on the news, they go back to their lives. Yes. And I think I had some hard conversations with people I love. And Peter and I had a lot of these conversations about, hey, you know what, this isn't another day for me, or I need a little space right now, or I need this acknowledged. And it just, I think it became politics and personal have become interwoven. And it, it I, I can't separate mm -hmm. them anymore, you know? Peter, where are you on uh, on this? I mean, our racial divide, and I mean, I, I love that you and Whitney kind of had lots of conversations about it, saying you need some space or or whatever, but where, where is your head around all this social injustice and what the hell's going on? Oh, yeah. man. I mean, I think um, for me, it, uh, a line has been drawn in the sand of like, how can you be an art maker and not be political? And how can you, how can you tell stories? And really, I, in, in my opinion, kind of, um, in what we do engage in the most, like one of the most empathetic art forms of like really trying to understand uh, another person's and another human being's, uh, experience on the earth. And, um, and, and how can you not, bring your whole self to to like bring about a world that you want to see um so it it's it's a huge moment of rec reckoning for me personally but i mean it's it's been um essential to 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 reach out and like to all of the different communities that i have and my, my friendships my great friendships and and um trying to figure out the best ways to be useful and um, sometimes that feels elusive and that's like, it's mm -hmm. easy to fall into a moment of despair of being mm -hmm. like, oh shit, everything is, oh, excuse me. Uh, everything is, is, is miserable and nothing's going to get better. And then um, having friends and collaborators like, like Whitney and hopefully um, doing the same thing for her of like lifting each other up when we are, when we can't walk by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. I think that's what Joy and I try to do for each other as well. Absolutely. Um, um, and I, I think that's a great segue. Um, thank you, Peter, into talking about the Radar Festival, um, which is what we really want to focus on here today. And Capsule, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, sponsored by the Public Theater. Uh, Whitney and Peter, uh, you know, you guys can go back and forth talking about this project. And I mean, Joy and I tried to do as much research as we possibly can online about it, but you you, you don't give a lot. So <laughs> um, <laughs> please, please enlighten us. Yeah. I'm dying to know what, what, what this is about. I mean, I have an idea of what it's about from what I saw, but I, I would like some more detail. Yeah. I mean, okay, Peter, I'm going to jump in. I think... Please, please. You know, Capsule is a refraction of our our collaborative relationship within the context of the year 2020. And the way that this, it's really funny because when the shutdown happened, we all had to look around and cope however we could. And Peter and I fell into this process. We've done shows before together where, first of all, we were communicating a lot. Um, and we started sending each other songs like, almost every day, every other day, months for months, this went on music sharing, virtually getting on zooms, figuring out all this technology, finding a way to keep making, um, which I'm so grateful for to this day. And the music 
was very different and it had a lot of power and I was really excited about it. And it was funny, like I went back and read our entire text exchange from March to when we really started working on it. And it was a real trip. It was like, how are you? I'm not well, I'm not okay. I need help. Brianna Taylor. It was just like this, it's it, this really wild kaleidoscopic refraction of where we were mentally and emotionally and how we were coping with it and how we were meeting each other. And then also having moments of not maybe meeting each other. And so the piece for me really came out of an exploration of that. And also just a very interesting technical coping response was like, make, 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 make. And I was like, I got to evaluate that. Like in a shutdown, I feel like Peter and I went into this weird turbo drive and there's something really wild about it. So while the piece is kind of exploring mental health, it's also exploring how the outside world affects the inside. And I think I'll, I don't know, Peter should take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's that's such a beautiful way of putting it. Um, I think just going back to that that text chain, it, like it was such a clear document of of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Because these things happen, would happen, and it would like reverberate so much and so profoundly that we, everyone that we knew or everybody that was kind of within our community, that's the thing that was on our mind. And this kind of collective consciousness, um, which we kind of um, play with in this piece um, of of how to um, stay engaged with each other and how to have that same kind of collaborative and imaginative um, friendship and 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 journey with other people, but being apart and not being able to share space and sit like at a table and read pages together. Um, so and like there was a there was a key point where it's like this collaboration and friendship was holding me up. But I think, you know, it became quick that collaboration and art is not enough. Yeah. Right. You can't <laughs> just do an aesthetic thing and put the politics aside. And there came a point where I was like, I need I, I need I think so many black artists and people were like, actually, I'm alive. I'm here. See me. And I need. And it's like the old way of doing things aren't going to work for me anymore. And it, that's a scary thing to put a new, to look at an elephant in the room and deal with it and try and deal with it in a piece. So I think for me also, it's coming from this place of like art and collaboration and aesthetics is not a, like, we just need to be having the conversation. How do you have the impossible conversation that could make the very fabric of your very essential relationship unravel? Do you mm. know what I mean? Um, and that's, what I'm trying to explore in the piece. So can you give, um, I, I hear what the whole kind of overall concept of it is, but can can you give a little bit more details into, yeah. in, into what the piece is and, yeah. and how it's structured? Well, you know, we love- <laughs> Sorry, I, I know oh, I'm yeah, very no. nosy too. Of so course, of course, <laughs> of course, I love nosy. I'm like, I want to know the characters, oh, it's the, okay. the journey. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. We love to make music and the, the musical, do you remember Passing Strange? Passing Strange, of course. it changed my life when I saw that by Stu and the Negro pro Problem and Heidi because they found a way to bridge concert performance and theatrical performance to me in a really honest, exciting, not cheesy, um, contemporary way. And I feel like I've been chasing that format ever since. Hmm. Peter and I work on a lot of shows and I'm always trying to put ourselves in there as characters, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's something else. And I'm, I just, I always like to joke, like I can get my homegirls to pay $80 for an Erica Badu show, but I can't get them to see one of my fancy off Broadway shows for free. What is that about? Like what, what is it about concerts that make us feel so alive? And so the capsule, if we weren't in this situation, it would be a concert play in which we'd play, Peter and I are in it, and we basically play ourselves, kind of refractions of ourselves, in which we, we share texts, there are scenes between us as we're exploring 2020, what's happened to us, race, politics, everything, mental health, and there's song, you know, I was very inspired by David Byrne's show as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's, 
a concert musical essentially, but how do you do that on film? And so it doesn't look like a play on film. What we tried to do was explore it cinematically. So like, mm. as opposed to me playing on the piano and singing at you, all of a sudden we're catapulted, you know, upstate and there's like physical movement and cinematic shots. So instead of just doing a play on camera, we really tried to be like, what is the film version of this? Is it possible? And that's, that's the piece, you know? So, yeah, and I, I think the big one of the biggest gifts I've received over this very, very strange, prolonged uh, lockdown um, that we've all experienced is like, we actually got to shoot a film together. Like we had a crew, we got to go up to uh, uh, upstate to the Catskills. We quarantined for, and like made sure that we were as safe as possible. And then like, we actually got to make something together and like the, Gosh, it was such an emotional moment for 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 me, like like being around other artists and being in the same space and spending nine days shooting this film and um, making all of this music and and breaking bread together and it it, it was revitalizing and mm -hmm. definitely um, I think so that it it differs in that way from a lot of the kind of um, art making that's been happening uh, remotely because it's a mix of us. Um, starting out in more of a, I was going to say, a traditional Zoom theater. <laughs> but uh, it starts in that place. And then we get to actually be, be in together. real space and yeah. time. Um, and like, I can't stress enough how wild it was. We started this process virtually. <laughs> We met every week. We talked every day, but we met, we had a cadence. We had a 10 a.m. meeting with our other collaborators and I have to shout them out. Tabby McGard, Tyler Dabrowski. We have an incredible team. And um, we wrote this script. We, re we recorded our songs with these very microphones and gear that you're seeing. And it was a huge experiment. And there was the Zoom version of it, yeah. Or there was the, you send everyone kits and then you edit something together. And I was like, can we go for this? Yeah. And it was really challenging and exciting. And somehow it's come together. But it was crazy, you guys, because we were working virtually for months. August, I'd really say it, May, we really started going on it. So from May until November, we only worked virtually. And then in November, we finally got to come together. And that was very fascinating sensation that like, I'll never forget that feeling. Yeah. Kind of trying to remember how to be around people, you know? Oh. I, yeah, my I was wife, gonna ask that, yeah. Yeah, like my wife and I live in Inwood and you know, I see this this one person. And so you have like a, um, you know, a, a routine and a lifestyle, but like, I, I forgot how to be around people. Mm -hmm. It felt like it, I, I got kind of like social anxiety that I wouldn't have felt in long because it was such a strange sensation after all this time. Well, we get so used to the mask and staying six feet apart. And I, I'm fascinated about when you guys went up to the Catskills and were finally together. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. It. So the other thing I should say is, you know, Peter and I wrote this text and we wrote how many songs ended up on the album? Like nine? Uh, 11. 11. Sure. Whoa, 11. And um, so we'd been working hyper intimately over this weird computer Doom Zoom medium. And then when we went up there, there was just like a leap. Like everybody had to take a leap and be like, okay, we're making again and we have to do it right now. And there was a day where Peter and I just did music for a whole day. And I think that was very healing. Again, like music has really gotten me through this time, you know, in so many ways. Um, and we had to like be in a room together for hours. He, Peter produced the music and we're like going at it. And it just felt, it felt surreal and it felt scary because I don't know when we'll be able to do that again. Mm. And not to be a drama queen about it. When I watch clips of the piece and this is the first stop on the piece, you know, that's the wonderful thing about under the radar is it's for experimental work and new work. And I see so much possibility for it post the festival, you know, but it's like, 
it's hard for me to watch some of the very successful sequences in it because all I can feel is like, I don't know when we're going to do that again. Yeah. Uh, so that's a fascinating thing. Like there's a sense memory now. I mean, think about it. And I wonder if the listeners can think about it too. It's like we take each other and person to person contact for granted. Mm -hmm. Like theater is a gift. Sitting in an audience, being on stage, directing, being a crew. It's a crazy gift. And now that it's gone, it's, boy, do I really miss it. Even the hard parts, even the, even a bad review, hell, even the audience, like just how much do you miss it? And so I watch, I listen to the album that we made and I watch the footage and I just get a very strange, like phantom limb kind of mm. grief. Um, yeah. I love that you guys have combined um, your acting and your singing and your love for music in this. And when I went down the rabbit hole of what is Whitney and Peter Mark, <laughs> I um, see that you guys both went to Brown. So did you guys meet there? And yes. also, did you like tell me about the um, trajectory of becoming this incredible multi hyphenate? Because now, you know, you started as actors and directing and writing together. And so was this something that you guys started as young people before college where you're like, I have all these different talents and I want to do them all? Or did you discover that once you were in school? What do you think? Wait, you want to go or you want me to go? Um, <laughs> go first. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I grew up playing music. I'm, I'm the youngest of, of four um, and my two brothers and my sister, everybody played sports and did theater and played music. So I just kind of followed suit and did every, like what everyone else was doing. And I actually, um, initially went to undergrad for, um, jazz guitar. And so that uh, it's always been with me and, and like, to some extent trying to, to pursue it in a kind of more professional kind of yeah. serious way. Um, but. I fell in love with acting and decided to, to pursue that as, as intensely as I could and um, went to, to Brown Trinity Rep up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I was a, a third year when um, Whitney came into the acting program as well as a first year. And um, like strangely enough, you know, it's, it's so funny how it's like we were, we've become such close friends and, and great collaborators, but like, you know, we, you didn't really get a chance to hang out with people outside of your, your own class when you're in conservatory like that. So it was actually um, uh, through one of our um, our mentors and professors at Brown, Brian Murtis, he, he does a, a Lake Lucille checkoff project every summer at an old stone house in Rockland County. Mm -hmm. And it's just one of those chance things of like, hey, what's going on? We should like hang out. Let's like do something. Like yeah. you play music, I play music. And then we started doing these concert plays that uh, Winnie has has been working on, these Shakespeare concert concert plays with Joe's Pub and, and other places as well. And um, just kind of fell into it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it is funny because we didn't really know each other in school and we just missed each other. Like first year and third year, you're like just coming in and getting out. But the funny thing for me is, similarly to Peter, music was the first thing I ever did. I was always singing. I thought I was going to go, I thought I was going to be an opera singer. <laughs> God, hey. shout out for my mom. My mother has sat through so many singing recitals, y'all. Janice, uh, I love you so much. I love my mom <laughs> so much. Um, but, you know, I applied to like all these opera schools and I got into a bunch. And weirdly at Northwestern, I didn't get into the voice program, but they're like, you have really good scores. We'll set you up with a vocal teacher, but come here and pursue another major. So that was like this weird detour. And while there, I fell in love with musical theater. But to be honest, how I kind of got into directing was, and talking about our prior conversation about race and this time of healing and this time of reckoning, it was like, and I love all these musicals and it's not, I don't want to throw shade at, at pieces of work that have transformed people's lives for the better. But mm -hmm. I, I spent all this time getting a musical theater certificate at Northwestern. And then I had a really robust acting career, but I, I was in hair as the radio or hairspray or rent 
um, or just any token African-American female. And that wore off really fast. Mm. And I said, well, I have more stories to tell. And I remember my first agent at the time, she's like, okay, well, let's start getting you on TV. So I booked my first TV show. I was on um, the Playboy Club and I kind of played like a singer in the club. And then after that, I was going in for what I call the standard stereotypes of black women. It was either like someone's um, token friend or whore or ghetto mom with a bazooka gun showing up in random ER like show. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. These are not. Wait, you don't have a bazooka? <laughs> I don't have a bazooka. Um, <laughs> contrary to what may, some people may think. But I was like, these roles are terrible. And the work I'm seeing isn't reflecting the world that I want to live in. Um, what can I do? And I went to Brown and Brian Murtis and all of the faculty there, they, they changed my life because I went in Brown as an actor and Brian was like, you have more to say, you need to try and write and you need to try and direct. And, and that's how I came to directing. But it was funny because I never wanted to give up doing the music, but it's like being a multi-hyphenate is still something new. Um, I feel in our business, while everyone is a multi-hyphenate, being out and proud about it is still a very new thing. And so, yeah, Peter and I were up at Lake Lucille. Um, it's incredible what they do up there. And I was like playing the piano in the band and he kind of did some stuff. And I was like, I want to do these concert play Shakespeare's. Do you want to try? And that was in 2016. And we've just been going at the form of concert theater ever since um, and now here we are I, um i just want to encourage our audience um watching on youtube to uh post your question for um peter and whitney um but i have a question before i get to um first question um whitney and, and peter how do you I, I hear what you're saying about how people are not um seeing uh, actors as who they are, and you're only getting cast in, in certain things, as you, you said, the woman with the bazooka that walks into the ER, or uh, somebody's whore, right? Yeah, I bet it was. Did you book it? <laughs> I but, definitely uh, did not book oh, it. Oh, you didn't book it. All right. But, <laughs> but like, what is this? <laughs> what do you, do you see things as as we are evolving, or do you feel like we are not evolving? Do you, do you guys see change in the theater or are, are, is it like a ship that's just moving very slowly? I see a lot of change personally. And I only can take myself as the, my own litmus test, if that's the right phrase to use. But I see, I see more openness. I see a lot more openness. And I think that this, on um, this digital time is also useful because people are seeing that, oh, this lighting designer can also edit, or this sound designer actually has great directing notes, or this actor has a brilliant idea. They should start their own project. So, I mean, I, Peter, I don't want to talk for you, but Peter's been working on this incredible project with the Vineyard Theater and it's like started and kind of galvanized by these actors. Um, and so I am seeing people take the creative process agency over it and i'm seeing institutions because it doesn't matter how much we multi-hyphenates want to do something it's about where's the funding going where's the money going who's getting programmed and who are the builders build, buildings let who are the artistic directors letting walk into the building and i'm seeing more and more people get the keys to buildings that are comfortable with someone saying hey i'm a director writer i'm a musician costume designer you know what i mean and i think i think it's healthy it's only going to make the work better. So I feel like I am seeing people more and more open to it. And the way I judge that is just looking at who's getting the grants commissions and who's who's getting programmed. And I think about like Danetta's one woman, her piece that she did at WP, like yeah. she's fierce multi-hyphenate. Alicia Harris is multi yeah. It's like, I'm seeing people break into the buildings more and more. And that feels like change to me. I also feel the theaters are um, opening the doors Mm -hmm. uh, you know, places like WPA and the public and uh, a lot of the off-Broadway, you know, theaters, I think were ahead of the curve, I think, and maybe some of the Broadways, maybe I misspoke, but I, I just, I feel like that's where the, the work and openness is a little bit more than the white way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's very uh, exciting to see you guys take control of, you know, your narrative and 
put things out that are important to you. What's the process that you've gone through, particularly like with Capsule or with any of the other things? Do you, um, have you, have people come to you and commissioned you or are you writing your things and then pitching it to people? What's been your process? Um, well, it's funny because when I got I got off the ship of grad school, I came to New York with like $200 and six cents in my bank account. The real number. I'm never going to forget it. Uh, in 2015, and I was applying all over the place. And Ars Nova was the first theater to be like, OK, we'll give you some time. And they let me get an Ant Fest. And I kind of wrote my first concert the first one I ever wrote, which I don't know if anyone will ever see again. And that's okay. But like, <laughs> I'm really proud of it still. But that just that little doorway from that doorway to here, I'd say this is a really beautiful, huge platform we have with Under the Radar. But it's been, you know, Peter and I, we performed in a barn. We performed in mm -hmm. bars, like lots of Joe's <laughs> Pub. Like this is really the first time we've been able to like pay ourselves and other people. So even though it, a lot of people say, oh, Whitney, things are happening so fast. I'm like, well, you know, I did start all this in 2008 with a like, musical theater degree. So it took from 2008 to like today, I'd say, to get this level of faith um, from an artistic institution, which I take super, I don't take it lightly and I'm really proud. And, and you know, for this Shakespeare we're doing, we're going to work at ART in Boston. And I feel like this year, last year, wouldn't you say, Peter, is when it yeah. all kind of, you know, I would call Peter, and Peter is like a very successful, accomplished, talented actor who like does fancy things like TV. And I'm like, I, it's always been calling Peter and be like, hey, I've got $50 and um, <laughs> we're going to play Joe's Pub and we have to rehearse like a lot. Is that okay? <laughs> and he's been doing that with me for like five years. So well, it, yeah, it's my it, favorite thing. Yeah. It's my <laughs> absolute favorite thing. And I think that uh, one thing I'm so grateful for, for Whitney. Um, is that I've, and something that I've learned from her is not like waiting for the, the, the normal channels to open up to you to, to be granted permission to create. It's like, and, and I think that's been reinforced during this time mm -hmm. when things have been shut down. It's like, don't wait for anybody. Like just start, yeah. start doing it. And, okay. and hopefully, you know, something will happen where you get to share it with as many people as you want to, to share it with. But like, um, yeah, that's. I think that's, uh, and a lot of our friends are just in awe of how Whitney can just kind of uh, uh. curate and also like bring people along with her as she um, just makes these amazing stories happen. I take, remember, take the compliment. Okay, I just remember one time in particular, like Peter was on Strange Angel, like he's like a lead on this big show, and I was like, I can pay you two hundred dollars if you can come do. You know, it was a lot of that for a very long time. You guys, mm -hmm. I can't sugarcoat it. But every time we did a show, we would get closer, and it would get better, and it would evolve. I think that's the other hard thing about making concert theater is it evolves. So even what you see that streams with the public, like that, it it's like a chameleon and I just build it and build it and build it. But, you know, I was joking about the barn performance, but that was like one of my most exhilarating memories I ever had. It was like Peter and I performing Ike and Tina Turner and the doors and like Macbeth in a, <laughs> in a like barn, like where we were at Breadla. It, yeah. it was like in wild Vermont, yeah. in Vermont. And I'm like, we have something, we can't give it up. And I know we're only getting so much money right now, but it will, We'll be able to buy sandwiches, I promise, someday. <laughs> <laughs> for like five years with him. So happy he's... So now we just get paid in sandwiches. Um, <laughs> so I, you had, no, please. I, I just want to say that um, to to call out our two other amazing collaborators, mm -hmm. um, Tabi McGar and Tyler Dabrowski, who Tabi, uh, we know from Brown Trinity as well, and... Um, also Tyler from the Trinity Rep community. And they're directing it. They're, the, yeah. they're directing it. Um, and producing it, yeah. And, and producing it. And just kind of the extraordinary joy of developing the shorthand with collaborators and like, you know, uh, getting to work with the same people over and over again. And the, yeah. the relationships getting deeper and you things happen so much quicker because you can kind of, Finish each, finish each other's sentences and yeah you, you know when you find joy and i went to grad school together so mm -hmm. um 
you know, when you when you speak the same language with the artists that you work with, things get things get through your head a lot quicker and you understand you're, you're all speaking the same language, period. Yeah. So yeah. the work can go quicker and smoother and, you know, it's not all, you know, flowers and uh, all the time, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, I can start a sentence with, Hey, joy, I think. And she'd be like, yep, yep. I know I fixed that already. Or mm -hmm. I already sent it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Is, um, that is a real thing. And yeah. definitely, you know, you asked about Brown Trinity. It is definitely a place that fosters multi-hyphenates. We are not the only ones. You know, Fiasco came out of it. It's like it is a community of people who want to expand themselves artistically in every way, not mm -hmm. just one way. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely very grateful to the program because I... I was lost. I was like, I wanted to be an actor, but I wanted to write music. And all I knew was that like these bad stereotypes were not going to work. And it was there right. that they were like, try something new. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I am talking to you guys had I not had that push. So I am very grateful to the program, actually. So I have a question. Sorry, Joy, we'll get you next, Joy, I promise. <laughs> You see me monopolizing. And everyone um, on YouTube, ask us questions. Here we go. I got one from YouTube. It comes okay, from actually, uh, God bless you, Donnie Repture, my friend asks. Uh, thank you for watching, Donnie. Uh, is there anything you found about making art in 2020 that will continue to ground your practice when we're all back together again? He's a smart guy. I, I, that, it's a beautiful question. I just don't want to take it for granted. Okay. I think of so many nights, gosh, I'm really emotional. I think of so many nights when you're going to the preview and it's like, oh, it's the, you know, just even the way the culture would talk about a preview audience. Just, I never want to take another audience, another person giving up time in their one life to see mm -hmm. my theater play again. I think that's, the amount of gratitude I have for the audience and for people right now is huge. And I, I don't, I hope to not, I hope to not lose it. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, you made me close my eyes. That was like a prayer. <laughs> oh, girl, thank you. I mean it. I just think of, think of all the yeah. things we take for granted. If it's, it's wild. And I, we're going to, I hope we think about it twice. Yes. Anyways, Peter, what do you think? Um, I just, I, I think, um, my relationship to like the industry itself and my place in it it's it for me it's been so easy to get stuck into a mindset of like what um succeeding looks like and what that means and how that informs the way that i am in the rehearsal room of kind of being super internal and thinking only about my, my myself and like how um going forward it's like just awareness of really how I exist in the world, but also how I exist in like this art form in this medium in, in this, in this, um, this, this business. Um, it just, it feels quite profound to me. Yeah. Go ahead, Joy. I know you got a question on the tip of your, your <laughs> lips. Um, what fuels your creativity? Like what recharges you? What gets you going? It just keeps me alive. I, I, that's a strange thing to say, but even the way that this whole piece came together, uh, it keeps me alive. Making keeps me going. Finding ways to like interrogate the questions I have and like speak to people. Like I, I guess I see creativity in making theater as a way of speaking. Not always so eloquent at speaking, but there's something about the art form of performance because it's not even always about theater because it's music, it's film, it's about communicating creatively across a medium. It just, it's like my therapy. And so I need to do it. Like I'm, I'm now in a way, which is scary, which is why Capsule is full of so much mania at times. It's like, I, I need creativity to keep going actually. Um, so yeah, that was such a beautiful like realization to have in 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 like my close friend group who you know mostly are 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 actors and and, and other artists that there is this kind of freneticism of like you have to do this 
it's going like something is going to happen whether um things are shut down or not and being so inspired by that like of of people just figuring stuff out like i'm gonna i'm going to create regardless of whether the world says i can or not um and like the electricity and the kind of energy and excitement that i'm like oh yeah like this this is this is what we this is our our offering this is what mm. we contribute what's your hope for um for our theater for the theaters regional theater off broadway broadway i mean everything asks um what's your hope for what happens in our in the next i don't know year to to two years I mean, I don't want to be a negative Nancy, but, you know, I'm worried. I am worried. It worries me to have to tell the 20 designers I was supposed to work with for the next year and a half, hey, I don't know when this is happening. I don't know when that contract's coming through that I promised you. You know, like, I hope, I hope we all in the theater industry just value each other more. Like I miss regional work as much as I miss Broadway. It's not a hierarchy. I miss my students' work. Oh my God, young people right now. Like what they're going through is unimaginable. Like having the shift in their life is crazy. So it's just like, I hope we all just value each other more because it's actually an ecosystem that works ladder. It's not all top to the bottom, which I think ticket sales and reviews and everything will make you feel like, you know? We all need each other, and I hope our entire kind of little theatrical ecosystem can come back, and and that when we do come back, we keep holding on to each other. I sound so cheesy tonight, mm -mm, but you no. know, like Shakespeare DC, I love them so much, and yes, I want to be able to go see The Lion King, but we need each other, and we're certainly all a part of the same little gumbo pot, and um, I don't want to forget that. I don't want it to go back to just being – New York theater, you know, it's, it's everybody's lives have been affected lives, pockets, health, everything. And so I hope the next two years, as we're finding our way back to stages, um, we just remember that. Yeah. There's a question from uh, YouTube from the four postmen, which is, I <laughs> can. <laughs> Uh, hi, Ken. Um, when, someone we went to graduate school with. Okay. And he wants to know if there's any chance that Whitney and Peter would bless us with a song. Oh, my God. I feel like I, I was wondering if we I was going to ask. I was like, should we stream one of the songs? I feel like it's weird for us to do it because we're not like by our instruments. But I do want to like we're going to be streaming. I feel like Peter, mm -hmm. you should tell them about this. We're we're going to be streaming the album and it's going to be really accessible. And I'm really excited and proud of that. It's like all the music. It's not going to be something, it's going to be something you can have and listen to yeah. that people can walk away with. Which so Peter, can you send us that information that we can put up on the website and then we can put a link on our website to the, to the album? The 100%. Album. Yeah. That'd uh, be great. There's, it's going to be um, starting uh, January 6th. Six or six or seven. It's going to be available in like iTunes and Amazon and Spotify and everything. Okay, like great. I will absolutely send it to you. And it, it's great. just titled "Capsule" by PMK and WW. And so, as of the six or seventh, mm -hmm. it will be on everything. And also mm -hmm. on the public site, we'll have a link to it. And we worked so hard on this music. I'm, I'm really excited to share it. I hope it gives you some release. That's what it gave me. It gave me yeah. release, and I hope it gives you some too. I can't wait. You know, you say. Um, about uh, the theater, regional theater, and the performers and the directors. You know, who I've been um, really feeling for, not only the students, but costume designers oh and tailors and yeah. backstage hands and all of those people who are the out of, the of work, the life of the life. They, they put the theater together and they're not performers, so they can't be streaming a concert, right. you know? So it's so interesting to me that- um, It's painful. You know, and we need yeah. we need some help. We, yeah. uh, In my opinion, we need some sort of bailout of, of yeah. some kind. We, like we I, need some help. I, I think at Trinity Rep, how some people that have worked in the box office for years, those people became my family. Like it, it just, there are so many people that give their life to the theater. Yeah behind stage, behind the scenes and on the stage. And um, yeah, you're right. We do need 
we need to help each other and we need help. We do need, we need it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We do need help. I'm just very worried about like the level of attrition of the people who might need to start doing other things to make ends meet, who might not be able to come back to the arts. Um, yeah. So yeah. Something sure. that we all should like kind of collectively brainstorm of how to help with. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in my opinion, we need some sort of bailout of some kind, some, some sort of, of help. Well, we'll see in like two weeks what happens. So yes, we will. <laughs> I'm not allowed to get political. So, um, but, so, uh, God, with you two being collaborators, um, who is on your short list of dream collaborators for the both of you? Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's 2021 speak it so you yeah can you know what it's i have to give a shout out to trent resner that's gonna seem really he for anyone who's a youngin or might not know uh trent resner is the front man and lead of nine inch nails it's my favorite band um and actually you asked about multi-hyphenates like reading his interviews and looking at his work is something that actively sustains me like the way he gets mm -hmm. better and better and i'm I wish I could drag him into the world of theater to do a piece because his music is it's iconic and transformative and there's nothing like it. So I think Trent Reznor is my dream. Yes. My secret dream. Have you yeah. seen Soul yet? No, I haven't. It's the animation on oh, Disney. Yeah. Is it good? He's, he did the music for it. So you got yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. You, know, you got to hold on, hold on tight because it, it'll take you for a ride. Okay, good. I was not expecting the emotion that, that came out of me. I was wrecked by that movie. Yeah, it really oh, was. Man. It, it, really? It's, okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it starts off really like very, very sweet, but by the end, I, I couldn't stop. Wow. Okay. What about yours? Uh, I, I just have, have gone on some, some deep dives of bands that really inspire me. And the, the, my favorite band right now is a band called the Bad Plus. It's a jazz trio based out of Minneapolis. So um, three guys, uh, Dave King is a drummer. And I had like, my, my wife got me a very sweet present of a, a drum lesson or like a music lesson with him for my birthday. So I got to like meet one of my heroes I, like over mm -hmm. Zoom and, be, and just be like, you just have to sit here and, and take this. And I'm going to just say how much you mean to me for like an hour. And <laughs> you don't have a choice because... It's my birthday present, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, just uh, uh, tons of musicians that yeah. um, I'm continually inspired by. Yeah, Peter, what um, I know you've you've done a lot of television, mm -hmm. um, and what I, you don't have to choose kind of a favorite medium though. But do you like going between the TV to film, back to stage, back to music? I mean, clearly you're a jack of all trades. You do you do it all, but do you? Do you love working in TV? I do. I, I do. I love the pace of it. I love um, the the longevity of it. Um, to to be lucky enough to be on like a, a series for a little bit and get to spend um, a, a long time with one person and see how they they grow and change and that's just delightful. And um, but is when I'm when I stay far away or if I have a period of time where I'm not able to do theater I just miss the the liveness of it and the the congregation and like the um the going out for a drink afterwards when people come like the whole event of it is just mm -hmm. I think my favorite thing in the world so uh I think I'm in love with all all three of the mediums and 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 hopefully I'll get to do more of all three Whitney, I got to ask about our dear dead drug lord. Um, it was an unbelievable show that kind of came out of nowhere and kind of <laughs> catapulted to the top of New York theater. Can you talk just a, a couple of minutes about what the experience of, of working on the show? Um, yes, thanks for asking. Shout out to the playwright Alexis Shear. I love her. She is a warrior and she is so kind and generous. Um, you know, while I like to make music and write, there are just gifts that there are writers that just can change your life. Alicia Harris, Lynn Nottage, and Alexis. And I read the play. And I was like, what? You know what I mean? I had this, I went, I just, I'm super physical and 
I remember I read it and I just like, I, I like kicked back afterwards or something. I was like, whoa. Um, Cause I, I found the articulation of like emergent femininity mm -hmm. extremely accurate and viable. And I was like, I've got to get in there. But I was nervous because I was like, I read it and I'm like, I told her, I think I remember telling her, I'm like, I'm going to go for this. Like, I'm not going to hold back um, because I think the piece is about feminine power. If, you know, for those who didn't see it, Our Dear Dead Drug Lord is about four teenage girls living in Miami who are all dealing with their own unique traumas and they have a magic club. And once you start to sub the word magic for feminine power, this beautiful allegory is kind of unlocked. And as the women are trying to resurrect Pablo Escobar from the dead, they're also learning how to deal with their emergent femininity. And um, I just, I didn't know what people were going to think of my direction because I was like, I'm not going to hold back. I remember being that age and I felt like I was losing my mind all of the time. I just thought I was losing my mind all the time. And that's what I wanted to get to the heart of. And it's also for me that piece is like, my PSA moment is like, we need to be talking to young people more because if we don't talk to young people about the world and give them resources and give them support, they're going to try and figure out their things themselves. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was also as, as powerful as it was, it was also a great kind of like, we need to be talking to young people that more and we need to be more there for them more. And so I just wanted to make it feel like a very intense fever dream from your age 15 to 17. And that's what I went for. I wanted to go for a feeling, not naturalism. I was, this is how I felt. Can you put a feeling on stage? It's always my question. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I think naturalism fails often. And so that play was like, I'm going to let go of naturalism because when I direct the scene in a naturalistic way, I don't feel anything and it doesn't look like anything I recognize. So as I kept, I just kept asking myself, how can I put more in this that I recognize and feel? And then, and then I choreographed that sequence and that dance sequence was really what cracked the play for me. Hmm. It was wild. <laughs> that, was my fa that was my favorite part for, for sure. I, Thank you. Both times I saw it and I would have seen it a third time. I, I think it needs to, I, it needs a more of a life. Um, it needs, it needs to continue. Um, you know, our time is gone by really, really quickly. Um, um, but I want to encourage everybody to, um, to stream. Well, you know what? You guys tell us yeah. where to stream, how to stream it. We'll, we'll put it across the YouTube thing. So please go ahead. The public theater is doing this amazing thing and streaming their festival. Under the Radar Festival is something they do every year. Artists from all over the world come together to premiere um, non-traditional genre bending work. And so the public has gone virtual with it and the entire um, festival, not just our work, but everyone's work in it will be available for free, which is amazing um, through the public theater's website, which I just think is amazing. I mean, if anything positive comes from this time, economic barriers kind of going down has been really positive. So that's the great yeah. thing is the public theater will be giving the world access to all of this work, all of these incredible artists. Some of Completely them free, right. Yeah. And there's a lot of great artists and a lot of great work that's going to be streamed. But for me, I, I can't wait to see Capsule. That, I've heard so much about it. I, I, I can't wait. And I can't wait to hear the music. Um, I thank you both so much for your time and your talent. I can't wait to see what you both do next when we get out of this freaking thing and um, and we are um, able to have human contact again on stage and be sitting in a theater um, next to somebody. I, yeah. I can't wait for that. Joy, you wanna say anything? It's been a pleasure and a joy. So thank you so much for your time and just, sharing everything with us. We really appreciate you. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, that's our show this evening. Thank you so much, everybody on YouTube for watching and listening, especially to our um, junkies, Ken Weiner and Donnie Ressler. <laughs> keep coming I back. Know their names. Please. Yeah, well, it says <laughs> it in, in my little box here. <laughs> that's but right, that's right, that's right. No, uh, I beg people to come on. So, um, 
thank you uh, both a lot. And thank you to our audience and thank you to the Lucille Hotel Foundation. Thank you to Joy. Thank you to the two of you. And thank you to the public theater. Don't forget to stream this incredible piece of work. Yes. Take care. Have a great night. Bye. See you next Monday.